afternoon. <laughs> I'm Bob Longo. I'm the music resource teacher from Toronto Catholic, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guest today. So uh, I just found out that I was going to do this, so I said, okay, let me Google, and it says, Susan Hukong Taylor has been hailed a singer with flawless range and commanding poise. Her compositions feature cogent lyrics and soaring melodies. That's all 100% true. But she's also a friend, and I'm very pleased to be able inter to introduce her today. She's been a colleague at the Toronto Catholic District School Board, and we've collaborated on a lot of music activities, and we are very, very honored to have you here today, Susan. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. I'm very, very humbled and honored to be here with you all today. Um, and as you can see, the title, or you saw the title for our time together is uh, Awakening Again to Amazing Grace. And this talk has three sections. Grace in creation, grace in me, and grace in one another. And I'm going to be exploring these themes through music, reflection, and poetry. And I'm also very, very humbled to welcome my friend, my most illustrious friend and esteemed, he's an esteemed musician, um, David Sarita, who will be accompanying us musically as we journey through this brief time together. So I see this talk as, a, as an invitation to you, uh, and I'm hoping that you will accept to pause, to rest, and to ponder the movements of grace in creation in you and in others. And so I'm just going to invite you now to just concentrate on your breath. Try and relax your shoulders. I don't know about you, but my shoulders are always like, kind of like this. Relax your shoulders. Sit up in your chair. Sit up in your chair. And make your spine tall like a tree. And if you can, place your feet flat on the floor. If you feel comfortable, place your hands on your lap, either palms up or palms down. And there are going to be visuals on the screen, but still, feel free to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to just breathe in now. And we pray, come Holy Spirit, I breathe out. Be with me now. Let's breathe in. Come, Holy Spirit. And breathe out. Be with me now. Breathe in. Come, Holy Spirit. Breathe out. Be with me now. So we are talking about grace. And so we're going to begin where it all begins for all of us, in the water. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the Spirit of God swept over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good.
magnificence near the ocean waves are coming in waves are coming in there is so much magnificence near the ocean waves are coming in waves are coming in there is so
some time just to bathe in the grace of creation to rejoice in it and give thanks for it but we have to ask the question what is grace. We use this word so frequently. We say grace before meals, grace under pressure. We say things like saving grace, fall from grace. We say year of grace. We say that we fell from grace, all of these different things. But what is grace in our context? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is basically getting what we don't deserve. And if I'm looking at creation, it is all gift. I cannot speak the world into existence. I, in and of myself, cannot generate life. It's not something I can earn, not something I can do on my own. I'm not able to bring myself into being, nor am I able to say, when my last breath will be. I can receive the gift, I can rejoice in it, I can give thanks for it, I can bear fruit in it, and I can live. But it's not here of my own doing. My life, all life, is gift. It is unmerited favor. Mercy, however, is not getting what we do deserve. So grace is getting what we do not deserve. Mercy, however, is not getting what we do deserve. And what do I mean by that? If we look at ourselves, honestly, look at ourselves in our human condition, we are in the struggle. We are beautiful, essentially good, but fundamentally broken. Our vision is inverted and defective. We struggle to see the truth of where we are in relationship to God, nature, and one another. If we look at the explanation of our human existence as it comes to us from the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we could say that, quote unquote, we took the bait. We believed the lie that you will be like God's. And we wrestle with that lie continually in spite of our best intentions. Our default as humans has been to place ourselves at the center which means God, all creation and everything else is here to serve me and not the other way around. St. Paul writes, I do not understand my own actions for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. <laughs> I can will what is right, but I cannot do it for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now in the world's view, if we keep making the same mistake over and over again, harming others, what happens? We suffer punishment, we get put in jail, we pay a fine, but God offers mercy even when we continue to fall short. St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. So again, grace is getting what we do not deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Think of it this way. 
Grace is kind of like the house in which the table of mercy is set. We enter into God's presence by the gift of grace, right? And because of God's mercy that we receive in Christ through the work of the cross, we're able to remain in God's presence and not die. And I just want to say this. So there are sins and there's sin, right? So there's a bit of a distinction. While we understand that Jesus took everything to the cross, nailed it to the cross, I don't think God is keeping a score sheet of all the things that we have done. If he stole a pack of photocopy paper or whatever it is. You know, I don't think that that's what's going on here. But nevertheless, even those little things, it's a measure of God's mercy that he's not keeping score. But Jesus came to us and lived and died and rose again because there's been a fundamental breach, right? There's been a fundamental break in our relationship with God and Traditionally, we call that sin or fallen nature, right? Which we, in and of ourselves, cannot repair. We cannot recover from this on our, all by ourselves. We cannot make ourselves right before God. So Jesus came that we could be healed and restored and reunited with God the Father through the Spirit. And that's all happening because of grace, because of God's mercy. And we enter into this new life through faith, which again, total gift of grace. So all of creation, including us as created beings, is proclaiming and manifesting the grace of God. And it's incredible to think that all of creation is living and giving in abundance, season after season, offering everything we need to live our lives over and over again, every raw material, every grain, every kind of fruit, every medicine. Just a, I'm just having a thought. I remember going into a store that you know, just sells honey. I'm a big honey fan. And they'll, you know, they have those little sticks of honey. And that's something that'll take a bee a whole, that's, it takes a bee a whole life to produce that, that little stick of honey. And when we think of the abundance in which bees create honey, like it's, it's, it's staggering actually. But here we are, right? Everything that we have, right? Every, every raw material and every medicine. We look at our bodies. They continue to carry us. They continue to replenish. Your skin keeps on coming back, you know? All of these beautiful things. And even with all of the stuff that we throw at our bodies, you're here, right? You're still moving. You're still doing everything. And, and, and it's amazing. Now, our faith tells us that it's through Christ that all creation was made. From the Gospel of John, we hear, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the light of creation it continues to shine in everything and in each of us because it is of God, made through God and for God, made in and by love and for love. And so a spark of eternity is here and in there, in each of us. And that spark is our hope, even when sometimes things seem to point toward destruction. So... Creation is telling God's glory, but again, we as humans, as part of this created world and as people who were appointed stewards of this beautiful creation, we don't often join in that chorus, whether by negligence, laziness, corporate greed, bad choices, any number of things. I think of the grievous things that have been done to our planet. I think of the ravages that our Earth continues to endure. But Earth always responds with kindness generosity and grace, correcting, sometimes gently, sometimes not so gently, right? And restoring. Grace comes and overwhelms what is seemingly unredeemable. So we started off meditating about the magnificence of the ocean. And the ocean in particular has indeed suffered a lot at our hands. We think of oil spills. We think of those great plastic islands the size of Manhattan in the middle of the Pacific. 
at the Atlantic. But even, even, I was thinking about this, even in these incredibly dire examples of violence that we've perpetuated against creation, against the beautiful and magnificent ocean, there is hope. God's creation itself offers remedy for what seems irreparable. I think of what Richard Rohr says. He says this, the cross is the standing statement of what we do to one another and to ourselves. And I put creation in there too. The resurrection is the standing statement of what God does to us in return. How do we see this imprint of resurrection in the created and broken world? Well, we see it. We see the dying and rising, even in the season of fall. You know, we, we, we see the leaves fall, but we know. We know spring is coming. You know, winter's going to come, and then spring's going to come. But I think in particular, if I'm looking at this very, very serious situation, right, I think of something that I, perhaps a lot of you know about it, I didn't know about it, something called microremediation. It's the use of much mushrooms, which are able to break down contaminants in both water and soil and transform and clean up what was devastatingly polluted. And I'm quoting an article here from Vice Magazine. It says, certain species including the oyster mushroom, produce enzymes that break down the tough aromatic hydrocarbons found in petroleum in addition to soaking up heavy metals like mercury. And in the Amazon, scientists have uncovered a fungus that eats polyurethane plastic. In Fukushima, they're using radiation-loving mushrooms right, to, to clean up that terrible nuclear reactor waste so, and they're saying that this is just the beginning. They're just scratching the surface in terms of what these mushrooms can do. So, as part of creation, we get to decide which side we'll be on, whether we'll be part of the healing grace or whether we'll be part of the destruction, whether we'll participate in this death on the cross or be conduits for new life and resurrection. Another example, I think of this young man, Boyet Slat, a young Dutch student who saw the problem of ocean pollution and decided to do something about it. He founded the nonprofit organization called the Ocean Cleanup. As an avid diver, he traveled to Greece at 16 years old and saw that there were more plastic bags than fish in the place where he came to dive. At 18 years old, he invented a way to extract garbage from the ocean, a giant 600 meter net which is able to funnel the plastic floating into a large um, catching container. In one day, in one day, they are able to haul 55, the equivalent of 55 shipping containers of plastic out of the ocean. And he estimates that by using this method, they'll be able to extract 90% of the plastic out of the ocean by the year 2040. It will take approximately 75,000 years for that plastic to break down otherwise. As Pope Francis says, human beings, while being capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing again what is good, and making a new start. So, of those times that we fall short, of the times in which we wound out of our own woundedness, our selfishness, our greed, our need for power and control and domination, Richard Rohr, again, he says this, the cross is the standing statement of what we do to one another and ourselves. But the resurrection is the standing statement of what God does to us in return. The cross, my friends, is the standing statement of what we do to one another and ourselves. But the resurrection is the standing statement of what God does to us in return.
salvation is all gift, a gift of unmerited favor, of which we are an integral part and an important part. We are known and loved, as is all creation. Scripture says, even the hairs on our heads are counted, and not one sparrow falls without God knowing. So can we respond in grace and mercy to the gift of creation? I ask you to consider these questions. Where do you see yourself within this created realm? Do you feel connection, alienation, hope, fear? How does creation speak the grace of God to you? How do you give God's gift of resurrection back to creation? I invite you to pray with me. Together can we say, gracious God, help me awake to the grace in creation, to your great glory manifested, created and recreated, ever new. Help me awaken to your saving hand, your generosity and saving grace, your unmerited favor that gives life without ceasing and restoration with mercy. Help me trust in the grace you have given me to bring about healing and wholeness to the world, to bring about the kingdom of God. I pray, God, your kingdom come. I think of thanks for your immense gift of creation. Amen. Hallelujah. the grace dwelling in each of us. I invite you once again to breathe in, breathe out. Let's invite the Holy Spirit in to walk with us and guide us through the corridors of our hearts. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. It's hard to sing the word wretch. I find that 
my lip curls and my teeth and tongue clash and make an ugly sound. A wretch. A wretch, well, the meaning of wretch is a miserable person, one who is profoundly unhappy or in great misfortune, helpless, hopeless. A wretch. Can we change the word? Can we change it? Can we say, saved a soul like me? Saved and strengthened me. Saved a well-meaning person like me. A wretch like me. Am I unhappy or miserable? I'm reasonably well, I think. I'm not in some great misfortune. No, I'm fine. Everything is fine. This person who wrote this, oh yes, he was a wretch. Slave trader. Horrible. I once was lost. I imagine for him, it was just business. A very good and lucrative business somewhat dangerous, crossing the Atlantic with thousands of souls for sale, then something happened. The winds changed and then stopped. The sails fell limp. Then the skies became a large eye and his soul was exposed. It was grace that taught my heart into the eyes of one who he had enslaved and the scales fell from his eyes to recognize that he too was chained but his chains were eternal so much heavier and utterly inescapable choking every last bit of light from his soul except for grace except for grace. How precious did that grace appear. So that was him, and this is me. I'm not in that kind of danger, or in that kind of desperate need. It's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful message. We sing and thank God and keep moving. I once was lost. Still, there are things that rub in those rare moments when I'm quiet and can hear myself breathing. After climbing the stairs to get to bed and laying awake for too long, things in me I cannot seem to change, things I cannot seem to surrender things that hold me and stop me, things that say I am not free.
solitude, first of all, to meet our Lord and to be with him and him alone. Only in the context of grace can we face our sin. Only in the place of healing do we dare to show our wounds. Only with a single-minded attention to Christ can we give up our clinging fears and face our own true nature. It is the nature of God's grace to rush down to meet us, to embrace us, and to lift us up. It is at the bottom where we find grace, for like water, grace seeks the lowest place, and there it pools up, as Richard Rohr says. So what's our work then? Our work is to believe. Our work is to believe that grace is our oxygen. We're in desperate need of it. And to deny that we need grace or to stand in disbelief of that fact, that's in fact the thing, the very thing that makes us wretched. Because we cannot of our own accord create an atmosphere of hope for ourselves in which we can live. Grace is the very atmosphere of our existence that continually calls us to our fullest selves. If we look at the Beatitudes, we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to be in a state of grace because one understands the truth of their need for God. And we know the angel greeted Mary, hail, full of grace. If we could say, well, why, why would they say that of all the greetings? Why would the angel say that? Well, I put to you, she's recognized in heaven that she was in a place of complete and profound understanding of her need for God. The psalmist says, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. And again in Psalm 51, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not take your breath. Do not take your grace. And we hear this comforting word from Isaiah, this reassurance of God. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear. I will help you. So I ask you these questions. I ask you to consider them. What places in me are still closed to the grace of God? How good am I at accepting the love and grace of God in my life? Again, I ask you to join me in this prayer. Gracious God, let me awaken your grace in me, coursing through me, giving me life and beauty freely and abundantly. Help me to awaken to the truth of my need, for without God's grace, I cease to be. But with God's grace, I am all I can be. Help me move beyond my imagining. Help me step into the light of life. Let me embrace the grace of the kingdom dwelling in me. Help me surrender so that I can be truly free. Amen.
are created to be in community, to walk together, to work out our salvation together, to support each other. And as we've been talking about all along, creation is continuing to manifest the grace, the misunmerited favor of God. We're called continually to manifest this grace, this unmerited favor to one another. We are told in the Sermon on the Mount to go the extra mile, right? If someone asks for your tunic, to give your cloak, to forgive 70 times 7, to love without condition. Why? Because we are of God and we must do as God does. And what happens when we do this? Well, we do. We bring about this beautiful Trinitarian love which is boundless. We bring that into our midst. And this is called the kingdom of God. And even, you know, in our most abysmal failures to love, God pours out grace through the work of the cross in Christ. When we destroy our created world, when we cut ourselves off or become alienated or distant from God, when we cut off from each other, these things are all hanging on the cross, yet still God is offering us life, hope, and resurrection in return. So I'm going to share a quick story with you. Peter, who's a cousin of mine by marriage, he's a cousin of mine by marriage, someone I've known since I was little. He's had a ton of health issues, one of which are two failing kidneys. Okay? He went through a lot of struggles on many, many fronts, but not the least of which was there were three people who had offered to donate him uh, kidney and he three people backed out so he'd been through a lot of turmoil he'd been through a lot of ups and downs a heartache and it and his kidneys are continuing to diminish and, and continuing to not function as they should now my niece Lindsay is my sister's daughter and after a lot of discernment and she and Peter are quite close she decided to a go through the test to see if her blood type matched and then B to go through all the physical and psychological testing to see if she would be an eligible donor which I must say took a really long time and C once she found out that indeed she passed all the tests and she was a candidate to be a donor she had to change her diet for months to make sure her kidney was healthy and then and only then she finally got the go-ahead to actually share with Peter that she was going to donate her kidney to him. Now that happened just this past August. It had been happening all of this year, but all of this, the announcement and everything went down in August. And the date for the surgery was set for September 11th. And then another roller coaster. Peter got COVID. So the surgery was delayed. And it was complicated. He had taken time off work, and everything had to be rearranged. But everybody persevered, right? So surgery was delayed, but it happened in early October. And thanks be to God, they're both healing well. All is well. Both kidneys are functioning. Actually, Peter's numbers are even better than Lindsay's, if you can believe that. But during all of these months in this whole process, there was a lot of talk in the family, right? Because families do talk. Lots of concerns and tons of objections. As you can imagine, one of the primary concerns was that Peter didn't have a great history of looking after himself. And so was it a good idea to give your kidney to somebody who may just relapse and continue to eat poorly, right, and not exercise? Is that a good idea? Even, it was at my birthday party actually, family gathering, somebody said, you know what, because they're in the States, and said if Peter was in Canada, he wouldn't even be eligible for a kidney, for this kidney transplant, because of his weight. And that was kind of disturbing. But anyway, one of the things that Lindsay, who, as I said before, is quite close to Peter, one of the things that she saw, and I love this about her, she saw that this was Peter's shot. This was his chance. And she, through her own discernment, decided 
to enter into this movement of grace, to be an agent to help him to make this shot and make it count. And I remember telling her, when she shared with me that she was going to go through with this, I said, you know, Lindsay, once you give your kidney, you have to release it entirely. And you cannot judge him or hold him to any standard of life. Once that kidney's in him, it's his. And he can do with, with it what he chooses. And we walked that night. We went for a walk, and she was telling me, and, I, and, and we walked for a little ways in silence. And she said she knew. And I thought to myself, for days after, I thought, wow, extra mile, many miles, cloak, tunic, giving of oneself so that someone else might live. And then I thought, well, of how God is with us, isn't that exactly what's happening with most of us every single day? Am I perfect in the care of my body? Am I diligent in caring for myself? Am I humble enough to ask for the help? You know, if we're so quick to say to each other and to ourselves, you're not worthy, you don't deserve. And so often we run in from God in shame because we think that we have to earn God's favor. But even when we abuse the gifts of our bodies, our talents and our lives, even when we're stuck, God's unmerited favor poured out on us. St. Paul writes in Ephesians, the God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, and even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasur immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So I'm sharing this story with you as a beautiful example of the manifestation of the kingdom of God. Lindsay and Peter are manifesting the kingdom of God, being what God has made them to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works and stewardship for, of the great gifts given. And this is all done within that beautiful house of grace. Through grace, we are called to be what God has made us to be, God's children living life to the fullest through that very, very same grace. And through grace, we have one another to help us see ourselves, see our gifts, draw those gifts out of one another, treasure, encourage them, and help one another to move to greater heights. I'm sure many of you are blessed to have good friends, good people around you. And if you are blessed to have a good friend, it's a blessing indeed. It's a blessing to have someone who truly sees us and loves us, sees our potential. And it's a marvelous manifestation of the grace of God. And this, I think, is our call, to be someone who's willing to be a kidney buddy, whether literally or figuratively, as we journey through life together. I want to share this song with you. It's a song that I wrote for my dear friend Anna, my ride-or-die friend. And I think this well encapsulates what I'm trying to say about awakening to grace in one another with gratitude.
good am I at saying in my time of struggle to my family and friends, I need you. I'm going to invite you to pray one more time with me. Gracious God, help me to awaken to grace in my neighbor, my friends, my family. Help me bow to the God-given grace planted in those I do not understand and struggle to love. Help me to lean into the grace that will help me to grow in compassion and mercy. In gratitude and humility, let me receive your grace as it comes to me through those who love and care for me. Let me give your grace freely to all around me in gratitude, I pledge now to walk by the faith given to me through your amazing grace. In gratitude, I will embrace the hope you give to me through grace. In gratitude, I take my place given in grace as a child of God. very much. Please give a huge round of applause to David Sarita. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I know we ran over time, but uh, so 
God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.